Hi guys, welcome to Cryptids Canada. I hope everybody's having a great day. So all of you know, I am a real soft heart and I have a difficult time with the emotional stories. Okay, I admit it. But this story that I'm about to read, believe me, I have tried to read this story three times, two or three times. And I just gave up and went to plan B because I get so emotional. But I'm going to buck it up and I'm going to get through this story. Um, so be patient with me, be understanding, but I think you guys will understand why I'm having such a hard time with this. I think there is a lesson to be learned from this story. So, okay, enough of the jibber jabber. Let's just get to it. Ooh, okay. Hello, Miss Leslie. I'm writing, I guess, to try and release myself from some of this guilt that I'm struggling with. My husband, or rather ex-husband Bill, and I, Sue, were married in 88. We had a three-year-old daughter, Annie. We bought a nice piece of land in Northern California. I was a substitute teacher, and my husband had just started his business. We were young and in love, our lifelong dream was to turn our house into a self-sustaining homestead. We had a fair amount of property, but most of it was forests. We were going to start removing the trees and open the land up for pastures to raise beef cattle. This was going to take time, and we were fine with that. Then tragedy struck in 1992. My husband lost both his parents within eight months of each other leaving no one to care for his 10-year-old brother, Rodney. Of course, we stepped up. I had always had a special spot for Rodney. For years, he was no trouble to me. We always thought Rodney had some type of mental issues that made him nervous of human relationships. Nowadays, he would definitely fall under the spectrum of autism. Rodney was not diagnosed with anything at the time. He was very innocent in nature and didn't make friends easily because the other kids would take advantage of his kind heart and bully him. He had been homeschooled, and I was more than qualified to continue doing so. Rodney's favorite pastime was playing the piano and the flute. He excelled at both. When Rodney was two or three, he heard the story, The Pied Piper, and became obsessed with the flute. So when he moved in with us, one of his favorite pastimes was to wander the woods playing the flute for the animals. Bill was concerned about this because he didn't want Rodney wandering off somewhere in the woods. So he spent a whole week roping off the first pasture that we were planning on clearing out anyways. We called it the big playpen for Rodney because he knew he wasn't to wander freely past those ropes. Then we unexpectedly got pregnant, and I was so sick. I admit I was not caring for Rodney as he deserved to be cared for. All his needs were met, but I was ill and I wasn't running after him as I should have been. We would do school every morning for four hours, including Saturday and Sunday, because Rodney needed the structure. Then we would have lunch, and then Rodney played piano for about an hour or so, and then he would go play in the woods with his flute or play in his tree houses that Bill and I were building for him in the woods to the side of our house. One day, Rodney came in all happy and excited that he had made a friend. I honestly half listened because my head was in the toilet. I really didn't believe it was a real friend because I must admit, he described a boy a little older than him or a little taller. And I asked his name and Rodney laughed and said, it sounds like Gerdal. Bill believed he was a boy from India. But how was he getting into the playpen? He would have to walk at least a half a mile from a road or the neighbor's property. And as far as we knew, our neighbors had no kids. So we just believed that it was a made-up friend. This went on for a while. Then he started saying that Gerdal and his family were listening to him play piano after lunch. When I asked how and where were they, 
He said they would stand by the treehouse. One day I actually saw Rodney stand at the window and wave. Then I walked up beside him to look, and I actually saw a flash of black, but it disappeared so fast. I didn't really give any thought to it after that. Then it was quiet for a while. We didn't really hear about Gerdahl that much, and I recall it was late spring because our daughter was just born. And one day Rodney came home soaking wet. I asked what happened and how did he get so wet. He said he went swimming with Gerdahl. I called Bill in and said, Okay, Rodney, tell your brother how you got wet. He said, I told you I went swimming with Gerdahl. The funny part was, there isn't any lakes or streams for miles. As far as we knew, we had a tiny little underground stream that we could tap into to feed our crops and our livestock, but it definitely wasn't big enough for Rodney to swim in. I demanded to know how he went swimming when he had only been gone a little over two hours. He said Gerdahl's parents came and took them. Bill and I looked at each other. We asked where they had parked their car, and Rod said Gerdahl's dad carried him on his back, and Gerdahl and his mom ran beside them. This fantasy was absolutely brilliant. I did notice the look on Bill's face, which showed a lot of disbelief. Those were the same feelings that I was feeling. So over the next year, the stories were becoming more and more elaborate. When Annie started showing interest in going with Rodney into the woods to play flute and to meet Gerdahl's little sister. Of course, I said no. She was too young. I should tell you that Rodney has a gorgeous live oak right beside his bedroom window on the second floor. We had discovered he had been sneaking out of his bedroom window at night to go and play with Gerdahl. So we nailed his window shut. Then summer came, months later, and it was hot as Hades in his room. He swore he would never sneak out again if we took the nail out. So stupidly, we unnailed his window. Then one night we woke up to Annie screaming. Rodney was trying to sneak her out his bedroom window to go play with Gerdahl's younger sister. Annie had made it halfway down the tree when she fell. Thank God nothing was broken. But the fight that ensued was horrible. Bill told me to leave because I was being unreasonable towards Rodney. I realized he had not dealt with his grief from losing his parents and his desire to please his parents by giving Rodney a perfect home took precedence over me and our daughter. So we left. I refused to let Bill take the girls back to his house for fear he would allow Rodney and his delusions to hurt them. One day, a few years later in 1998 or 99, Bill called me and asked if he could drop by. I said, sure, out of curiosity, because we hadn't spoken in years. So Bill and I sat at the kitchen table. Bill started off by apologizing then said he never gave much thought to Rodney and his friend Gerdahl until after I had left with the girls. He started listening to Rodney's stories a little bit more, and then one night while Bill was in his workshop a few weeks ago, he had saw a very large shape come out of the woods on the far side of the house. It walked to the oak tree, and then it started to make bird sounds. Then he saw Rodney climb down the tree. He was panicking because he didn't think Rodney knew the danger he was in. He said his gun was in the house, and all he could do was sit and stare out the window. Once Rodney was beside the giant thing, he realized just how big it was. Rodney only came to the bottom of his rib cage, and Rodney was just 19 at the time. He said he watched them walk into the woods together. Bill said he waited a few minutes and then called Rodney's name. Five minutes later, Rodney came running back and Bill pulled him into the workshed. He freaked out on Rodney saying, What was that thing? And Rodney said, Oh, that's Gerdon. 
I told you all about him. Bill said, Sue, I just stood there and stared at him. I didn't know what to say. He said Rodney had become more solemn and stopped talking about his friend Gerdahl. So Bill just stopped worrying about it so much. Up until that point, Bill just thought Gerdahl was an imaginary friend, much like I did. Then he said, Sue, do you know what this Gerdon thing is? I just looked at him and shrugged. And he said, have you ever heard of Bigfoot or a Sasquatch? I nodded, but I was speechless. Are you serious? And he just nodded. After that, he apologized and said, I know you cared and I was just ignorant. I owe you that much. He said, you know, I blamed you for years, thinking that you were just being hard on Rodney. But I know you just cared. And it was I who was ignorant. I owe you that much. He said, you know, Rodney felt responsible for breaking us up. You know, he was just a kid and he was telling the truth. Maybe you could call him sometime and just say hi. I nodded and I said, I will make sure to do that. Then he got up and left. I sat there stunned for a long time, just thinking about how everything happened. Besides the time when Bill would pick up our girls and take them out to dinner or to the park, I never heard from Bill. And then in 2005, Bill called to say that Rodney had gotten in an accident and had passed away. I have felt so bad all this time for doubting Rodney, but worse, I felt bad for not making that call to tell him it wasn't his fault, and it wasn't his fault that his best friend was a Bigfoot. I spoke to Bill over lunch one day, and I asked if Gerdahl ever came around, and he said, no, not that he's aware of. Then Bill said, oh, by the way, do you remember the day that Rodney came back soaking wet? I nodded. I remembered it well. He said he and Rodney were invited to go fishing at a friend's pond. And when they arrived, Rodney swore that that was the place where Gerdon and his parents took the boys swimming. So that's the story I wanted to tell you. If you can't read it, I understand, but I was hoping to tell you and your followers, that if someone tells you that they have seen something strange to you, please don't humiliate them or purposely disbelieve them. I just hope Rodney knows that I did care very much for him. And I am so very, very sorry that I didn't take him more seriously and that I hope he is in a much better place now where he can be happy playing his flute and his piano for all his Bigfoot friends. Thank you, Leslie, for reading my letter, and thank you to your followers for listening to my story. Signed, Sue. You know, I speak from experience when I say the worst thing is regret. All we can do, though, is live our lives to the fullest and make sure that people around us know that we love them. And if we just do that, I think we all feel a little bit better at the end of the day. Well, guys, I think that's going to be it. I told you I was going to have a hard time with this. Anyways, you know I love ya. Please have a good night, and we'll see you back here in a couple of days. Bye for now.